When you're fed up with fighting food and your body, join us here. I'm Ali Shapiro, creator of the Truce with Food program and your host for Insatiable, where we explore the hidden aspects of fighting our food, our weight, and our bodies, and dive deep into nutrition science and true whole health. Fair warning, this is not your parents' health care. This is a big rebel yell to those who crave meaning, hunger for truth, and whose lust for life is truly insatiable. Believe me, freedom awaits. Welcome to season nine of Insatiable. Our season theme is fertility. This topic often gets reduced to periods or pregnancy without regard to the physical, emotional, and soul process involved with our hormones, menstrual cycles, bodies, and identities, regardless if we choose to have children or not. In this season, we will take a holistic and integrated look at fertility to reveal you have more choices than most of us have been led to believe. Being in my eighth month of pregnancy, I'm now surprised I thought that Western medicine would be authoritative on fertility, as it is just as fraught with fear tactics, outdated science, and siloed thinking as nutrition, weight loss, and wellness. My hope is we fill the gaps you might not know are missing, have better questions to ask, and are able to get the results you want on your terms for your period, hormonal health, conception, pregnancy, birth, and the fourth trimester. This fertility theme is also the theme of our Insatiable membership community, where we will spend this fall, September, October, and November, taking a deep dive into the physical, emotional, and soul aspects of fertility cravings for your current life stage, whether you're menstrual, perimenopause and menopause, or postmenopause, and how to sync our nutrition, lifestyle, including exercise and work, and creativity to be in sync with our fertility. More details on how to join at alishapiro.com backslash IC2019. So welcome everybody to episode five today, Nutrition and Weight Gain in Pregnancy with moi. <laughs> today I'm going to do a solo episode, and this one was really inspired by a client session I had last week and tell you a little bit about her and she's given me permission to talk about this, um, obviously anonymously. And I just want to say, you know, I'm not a prenatal nutrition expert, but the big secret that I found is you actually don't need to complicate prenatal nutrition <laughs> and we'll get into that today. And so I wanted to do this episode again, inspired by this pregnant, this client. She recently got pregnant much faster than she thought she would and is in her first trimester, actually almost coming out of it at this point. And she has come so far with her food and body image. She told me because of the work we've done together, she's in a place where food, her relationship to food feels like a fantasy. It's a dream she never thought she could actually get to. She never thought she could be in a place of how she just eats with her hunger cues. She has no emotional attachment to food, still able to enjoy it. And yet she has, you know, she's like, you know, I came into pregnancy eating when I was hungry, enjoying the food. And she's also had next level emotional growth from us changing the emotional patterns that they are the reasons we turn to food, right? So she feels confident in herself in ways weight loss just can't give us. We were kind of joking that her, where she feels, how she feels about food really feels like a miracle, except she did a lot of work to get here. Um, it was rewarding work. It was fun. It was challenging. It was all the feels, but she's, she's done the work. And so she wants to continue to eat healthy and tune into her, her body. But one of the things that she's coming up against is she does have nausea in her first trimester. Um, and hormones obviously make you feel different about your body and will alter how and what you eat. And she also has a lot of friends who are in the, I would call it the conventional world or kind of have mainstream ideas about pregnancy. And if you're an insatiable listener or if you're one of my clients, you know, you start to realize that what we consider mainstream or normal is actually crazy. <laughs> and so she had a session with me about around like, how do I tune into my body? Um, because I can't really tune into normal, right? Because for example, her friends were like, well, you get to eat all... If you're nauseous, you could eat all the bagels, anything you want, you know, that's carby just to satisfy it. And she's like, but I don't want to eat that stuff. And the, the irony is her friends have never really had to pay attention to nutrition or food in terms of weight. So she has all this understanding of her body 
and what works for her and what she really wants out of this in a way that sometimes people who haven't had to struggle have ever had to look at. And we were talking about how, you know, struggling with food is so hard and it's very hellacious. And if you work through it, it actually gives you so many gifts. And I know I've been so grateful for here. I'm actually at the day of this recording, it's my 41st birthday and I am 37 weeks pregnant. So I'm like full term, <laughs> nine months. And so I'm also going to share a little bit about my own experiences today with this. So getting back to my client. So the place that she's in right now in the first trimester is she can't stomach a lot of healthy food that she's used to eating. And again, her friends are telling her <laughs> to eat whatever. People are telling her to eat every hour and she's to, to deal with this nausea or that's what you quote, get to do in pregnancy. And she is no longer a grazer. She's used to only eating meals and she doesn't love to snack. And this is very common with a lot of my clients is once they really work through the emotional stuff, food isn't as important if they still want to eat healthfully, but they don't want food to be complicated. They don't always want to be packing snacks or always have to think about food. And so really today I want to talk about confused about what is normal and what is conventional normal that isn't really normal, right? Very matrixy. In other words, if you want to have a healthy relationship with nutrition and weight during pregnancy, how do you figure out what works for you when your body is undergoing such rapid changes? And especially if it's your first pregnancy, you want to have some sort of standards to know what is truly normal versus conventional crazy so that you feel safe with your baby's health and your own, correct? Right? And again, I call it conventional crazy because we often what we often hear is normal pregnancy food symptoms and weight gain expectations out here isn't necessarily healthy. And it's a lot to navigate. I mean, I will be honest with you and, and you'll hear some of my pregnancy has been very easy. I've had no cravings. I've had no swelling. I've had no symptoms. But these last couple of weeks, I've had a, a couple issues come up, which I'll share later. And I'm just like with discernment fatigue right now. So I can only imagine if if you don't really know your body well, or you're not sure what foods work for you, how overwhelming pregnancy can be with everything that's bombarding you. So I'm hoping that today's episode will help simplify <laughs> prenatal nutrition and weight gain and help you support your relationship with both of them. And this is going to be how to listen to your body around food and weight gain in pregnancy. And it's the moderate place between listening to your body and not everyone else and what is normal for them. Because again, normal is a little crazy. And also without being a fanatical about being the perfectly healthy person, you maybe were or aspired to be when you weren't pregnant, right? Like my client, um, she was eating super healthy and now she's dealing with nausea. How do you navigate that? And I want to look at what's more evidence-based versus convention. As I said, what I've shared on social media and, and a little bit throughout the season here is I've really learned how much of our pregnancy care is fear-based and lawsuit, like cover your ass based <laughs> versus what will make us well and thrive. So I'm going to discuss how to eat well for your changing body and look at the psychology of eating and weight gain in pregnancy. So tuning into your body is easier because often we have these beliefs about in terms of like eat every hour or you're eating for two that make it harder to tune into what you actually need. And before we get started, I want you to understand where I was coming from when I got pregnant, because obviously this episode, I'm doing it, you're getting my viewpoint. I always try to separate my lens on the world. However, it's still my lens on the world. And some of this is informed by my own experience. Some of it's informed by my expertise over 12 years of navigating <laughs> what is evidence-based versus what really works in terms of weight loss, health, hormonal balance, all that kind of stuff. So I was coming into pregnancy and I really assumed I knew nothing about it. I never knew if I wanted to be a parent. It really wasn't until I was 39 and, and diagnosed with infertility that I was clear that I didn't want to be one. So I, you know, fertility wasn't a health area I was interested in or well-versed in. And I wasn't someone who really understood the magic of this process. I always admired the people who always knew or didn't know clear-cutly that they want wanted to be a mother or not be a mother because I was just like, maybe. And that wishy-washiness was like, ah. But yet many of us fall into this pattern, right? If I don't know everything, I don't know anything, right? And that's how I kind of came into this. And what I discovered is that's totally wrong. <laughs> what I discovered was just because I didn't know a lot about pregnancy didn't mean I didn't know my body. And I want to repeat this because it came up with this client that this episode is inspired by because that was really helpful for her to hear. Just because you don't know a lot about pregnancy, you can still know your body 
or you can learn to know what works for your body if you don't already. And if you don't know what foods work for you, I highly recommend doing that ideally before you get pregnant. Again, you always have time. A lot of people come to pregnancy and that's when they get into nutrition. And when your baby's born, only 35% of their brain is developed. Their immune system isn't fully developed. So you still have a couple of years after pregnancy, <laughs> postpartum, to, to still have nutrition have a very important role in your child's life. So realize that, you know, while it's important how we eat in pregnancy, nature has a lot of backup systems. And so we have a lot more. That's why we don't have to be perfect, et cetera. <laughs> but I really recommend working on knowing what foods work best for you and really knowing your body because you will bring a level of self-trust and self-awareness that is invaluable in pregnancy. And as I'll share, I had my own self-trust tested with a gestational diabetes experience, which I'll share later in this episode. And overall, like I alluded to earlier, I've had a really easy pregnancy. No cravings, no heartburn, no major swelling or major mood swings. I did get a cankle. I got one cankle. Isn't that hilarious? The other day, but I've been putting my feet up and using Epsom salt baths and they're going down, which is great. But all the work that I've done with my own truce with process, truce with food process and around my weight means I've also haven't had stress about the, I think I'm up to 35 pounds of weight I've gained and I'll get into how they told me to only gain between 15 and 25 and why I don't stress about, you know, going above those numbers. And because of my baseline self-trust, I've come quite far in my initial fear around labor and birth. And I want to share my positive pregnancy experience because I understand how warped and fear-based the USA's narrative is around the female body, fertility, and pregnancy. And like I said, I've done a ton of unlearning myself. I can't believe how much I've learned <laughs> in terms of how powerful and wonder, wondrous our bodies are. And I thought I was already kind of on that path. And I was, and this experience has just, you know, amped that up. And I also want to note that, yes, I've done the work to make healthy choices consistently. I am proud of the radical responsibility I took to arrive here. Like really proud. Like the fact that I'm even pregnant is a testament to all the work I've done, right? To sift through and and not take the Western medicine's diagnoses and handle setbacks. And I mean, I'm really proud of myself. And that's not the whole story. There's two other prongs that help us get results. And one is I have access to prenatal resources. We often refer to this as privilege or people who aren't quite as aware of privilege call it luck. And good luck is often privilege and bad luck is often systemic injustice. And I hate that we live in a world where, you know, I'm working with midwives or, or I am choosing organic food and I filter and clean my water. And that is a privilege. It's, I don't think it should be a privilege. I think we all can have access. There's not a scarcity of this if we were to change how our systems in America, at least I can speak here, but also I'm around the world since I have clients around the world. I know that, that other countries have similar problems that we do here in the U.S., but there are systemic issues that make it easier to access this kind of care. And some people don't, many people don't have access to that. And we have to acknowledge that it's not all about effort, right? It's about access to care as well. And then there's also a third prong, and I call this the great mystery. A lot of people might refer to it as God or the universe. But to me, it's that which we, we can't ever know. And it will leave us curious as to why things happen, right? I feel great today at 37 weeks pregnant and I could have something happen in birth or labor, or some people could take great care of themselves and still not have the same experience that I've had. And so I think life is ultimately a grand mystery. You know, I even think about my client, she's super healthy and she's struggling with more nausea than I did, right? It's, I don't think that's an effort issue. That's just a her body versus my body and the great mystery. And we really need to have compassion for ourselves and each other when we are struggling with our health and weight in life and not judgment. I think especially in the coaching world, it's so quick to, well, how do you take responsibility or whatever? But there is a mysterious part to life. And the wellness world often leaves out these last two prongs of the fork that go into results. And they're equally as important as the choices that we make. So I want to preface that with these are, you know, I'm going to give you guidelines that help hopefully <laughs> support you. And it's also life is ultimately a mystery and pregnancy, if anything, will teach you that. I mean, I love how Elisa Vitti said, like, my body is, and when you're pregnant, is literally 3D printing another human being. I mean, that's wild. And so there are, there will always be things we won't be able to control. And for me, the question that I, that always keeps me insatiably curious is, 
what is the great mystery and what can we control, right? Because at the same time, a lot of people have told me to just accept certain things around my health, from my depression to my acne to wanting to lose weight. And accepting those things meant exploring them, not just resigning myself to a life of antidepressants and rotating between various acne creams or, you know, binging because those kind of things. So that wasn't the right path for me. Some people, it can be, you know, but getting curious about my symptoms has led me to a level of power and health and even getting pregnant in the first place that I wouldn't have known as possible if I didn't stay curious. So we will never know (laughs) where that line is for us, right? Between the great mystery and what we can control. And so my philosophy is to do the best we can and see where that takes us, knowing each time we can learn more about how our bodies work and the level of choice we do have. And holding that sometimes we cannot explain things. I have a couple of clients going through some really rough things right now. They've tried really hard. It's in their life. It's it's not around health stuff and they couldn't have done anything else, right? And it's just sometimes the way the cards fall. So I just want to make sure that everyone understands this advice and recommendation comes under this idea that try to follow this and see how it goes. <laughs> and I think it'll give you your best shot at feeling great. So let's get started on what is actually healthy eating in pregnancy versus what mainstream offers you to do. And first, I just want to preface with what you eat does matter. It's not the only thing that matters, but prenatal nutrition influences your pregnancy experience. It will influence how you experience labor and recovery and health. And of course, it influences the baby's health. And there's lots of study on studies on this, and it seems like common sense. Again, you what after birth baby's brain is only 35% developed. The immune system is very immature. So those first couple of years, nutrition also matters. But here's the big secret I learned about prenatal nutrition. It's pretty much the same as when you aren't pregnant. (laughs) It's a whole foods, nutrient-dense diet. When it comes to fats, proteins, and carbs, it's still about balancing your blood sugar. And it's even more important in pregnancy because of the hormonal shifts. So what's good for you is good for your baby. You two are a team. And if you listen to episode three of this season, you know, we talked about getting pregnant as a side effect of being healthy. And part of why my client got pregnant so fast was her nutrition and emotional health is solid. Her body felt really safe and she's really strong. She works out and a lot of the stress that was turning her to food has turned into a lot more meaningful of a life and a much more supportive life. She, of course, still has stress. We all do, but she's learning to make more fulfilling choices. So For me, you know, when it comes to food, for me, I've basically eaten the same way I eat in my normal life, except I had to add an extra egg at breakfast instead of two. I used to eat two eggs with kale and onions. Now I eat three eggs. And I found myself exhausted an hour after breakfast if I I didn't add in like a piece of fruit. So that was added to my breakfast. And sometimes I didn't need a snack in the afternoon, but I ate the same snack I would if I wasn't pregnant. So it was just a little bit more food, but the same fat, protein, and carb combinations that would balance my blood sugar. And I don't have, I don't have cravings or mood swings associated with blood sugar in my normal life because of this. And so I didn't get crazy cravings or crazy mood swings in pre- pregnancy, I believe, because of this. Did I eat chocolate? Yes, but I wasn't actually craving it. It was because I wanted it. (laughs) Have I had moments where I have just cried because of how much I'm trying to manage as a business owner in in a country that has no paid maternity leave off? Yes, Um, but it's not a chronic anxiety. So I want to be clear that it doesn't mean I haven't had to make some adjustments with my food. It's just I'm not experiencing the extremes that I was anticipating. And you don't have to be perfect with your prenatal nutrition, which I think is really important I was joking, I think the first time I ate, I ate quote unquote unhealthy, we had Carlos's um, cousin was getting married in New Jersey and we took the Pennsylvania Turnpike. And I don't know if anyone's been on the Pennsylvania Turnpike here, but there's literally no healthy food at all. And I joke that, that our, our Bambino got turnpiked <laughs> because I didn't prepare ahead of time. I just didn't think about it. And on the way there, I think I had, I ate Roy Rogers roast beef without the bun, which by the way, it was like $7. People say healthy food's expensive. I couldn't believe how expensive it was for like roast beef. I mean, that's ultimately what I ate there because I didn't trust the Starbucks salad. It was during the romaine like E. coli breakout or salmonella something. So I wanted something than cooked. But yeah, like, and I felt guilty. I did feel guilty about like, I'm like, oh my God, this poor baby's gotten turnpiked because <laughs> there's no healthy choices there. And then, you know, we had, Carlos and I had a joint shower that was also an open house because we moved into a new house in February and we got a bunch of gluten-free desserts and 
and barely got to eat any at the shower because I was chatty Kathy with everyone. And we had them sitting around for a week and I ate them, right? And they were the, like the really sweet gluten-free treats. And so, but I had them, right? I didn't feel the need to be perfect. And some weeks my energy was just dragging and I had to skip workouts. I wasn't even working out a ton. I started out about five days a week and slowly four, and now I'm down to like three in addition to walking coffee every morning, but I just had to adjust with my energy, but it wasn't like these extreme swings that I used to do like when I was binging and stuff. Now the conventional media, and I've gotten them because I, you know you sign up for a baby registry or you sign up for a list and they, they tell you, they send you these ideas and I'm still get, I was getting recommendations for my calcium for low fat or no fat milk or highly fortified products like orange juice and breakfast cereal or like dairy for for string cheese, you know, and protein, but barely any whole food recommendations. I got this 10 foods to eat and I was like fortified breakfast cereal, a low fat yogurt for my calcium, right? Like I get my calcium through leafy, green, leafy greens and nuts and seeds because they also have magnesium, which help you absorb the calcium. And as I was reading this, I was like, no wonder people talk about pregnancy cravings and fatigue. I would feel this way if I ate like this normally in my life, let alone when the hormonal symphony is even more sensitive and changing. And another alarm bell for me with conventional nutrition advice is no acknowledgement of food sensitivities or allergies. One of the things I was really worried about that are common pregnancy symptoms that again, I wonder if they are really have to be there or if it's because we people's sensitivities come out in pregnancy. But they talked about heartburn, hemorrhoids, and constipation. And I was really worried about all that because I had irritable bowel syndrome in my early 20s and struggled with all of that. And so I was like, oh, is that stuff going to come back when I'm pregnant? Um, and I had some dairy early on in my pregnancy and I did have trouble with constipation. I removed it and I haven't even had heartburn yet here at 37 weeks, which was a constant for me in my irritable bowel syndrome days. I was taking so much, so many antacids. <laughs> like it's crazy when I think about it now. And some people get heartburn from lots of processed fats and sugars together. That's a sensitive combination. So the big food groups I would look at that can cause typical pregnancy symptoms are dairy, gluten, and soy. Of course, if you go into pregnancy knowing you have food sensitivities or allergies, stay away from those as well. And I also want to acknowledge a lot of these digestive issues are stress-related, right? Stress really influences heartburn and uh, GI trouble. Now, I have a very different type of stress being a business owner, and yet I'm at a place where it's really self-chosen stress. When I'm, when I'm having a lot of stress, I'm like, you chose this and feel empowered by my stress. It took me a while to get here, and some days are still better than others because life hands you lots of curveballs of things you're not choosing. But because of my own truth with food process, I'm pretty resilient and can pivot pretty, pretty easily. So a lot of this stuff, I want to acknowledge that I the stress that I know some of my friends have had to deal with, like going into an office, commuting, having other kids, having a ton of travel. I was really able to choose that I wasn't going to travel a lot. I don't have any other kids. I don't have a commute and I don't go into an office. So I do want to acknowledge that while I've worked really hard to get here and I've also been helped by privilege, now I can look at my experience and recognize that other people have stresses that that I just don't have to deal with. So I want to acknowledge that. But when you want to look for when you start getting common pregnancy complaints, are they symptoms, right? Are they things you really have to live with that nutrition adjustments can help with you, can help you with rather than accepting you have to live with them? And again, I don't know that line between the great mystery and our choices, <laughs> but I think it's worth exploring. But in general, you can simplify prenatal nutrition and to stick with the whole food diet with the right combinations of fats, proteins, and carbs that will work for you, and you will be 80% of the way there with your nutrition. As far as adjusting for pregnancy, I use these general rules of thumb to help me know if I need more carbs, proteins, or fats, both in my regular life and in pregnancy life. So if you're still hungry after you eat, you probably need more protein, especially animal protein. There's a lot of research that shows being vegan in pregnancy isn't, isn't the best. And now I have one of my best friends from college is a vegetarian, been vegetarian through two pregnancy, healthy pregnancies, but you do need to really focus on protein. So if you're still hungry after you eat, probably need more of that. Um, when my baby was going through a growth spurt in the early second trimester, which didn't match the general guidelines, by the way, <laughs> when they told me my appetite would be surging, I would wake up at 4 a.m. and just be starving. And I'd go down and eat chicken to fall back asleep. <laughs> it was not fun because I was like, I love my sleep and I have to go up and like, and I would eat cold chicken because I'm lazy. I wouldn't heat it up. If you have sugar cravings after a meal, you most likely are not getting enough fat. 
So you're probably only dipping your fork in your dressing instead of getting enough healthy fats at your meals. So if you're having sugar cravings while you're pregnant, try adding more fat until you don't have sugar cravings to know you're getting enough fat. And again, healthy fats, right? Not the oils like cottonseed and soybean, but avocados, olive oil, nuts, seeds, all that good stuff. And then if you feel really tired about an hour after eating, remember I was saying after my breakfast, I felt like I just hit a wall. You probably need to add more carbs into your diet. For me, fruit worked really well, and I actually started to crave it, uh, whereas in my everyday life, I never really felt like fruit. But my body, that was the, the simple adjustment it needed, <laughs> was just to add a carbohydrate at, at breakfast, nothing major. But if you find yourself really tired about an hour after eating, you're probably going to have to add in more complex carbs, like fruit, your squashes, your sweet potatoes, things like that. So again, your general prenatal nutrition guidelines are going to be out of date If you're following low-fat fortified food products and you want to shift to whole foods as much as possible. And as a baseline, stick to whole foods and strongly consider avoiding foods that trigger inflammation, which can feel like swelling in pregnancy, heartburn, constipation, and other GI issues. Now, there's a lot, I mean, there's like so much to talk about in terms of vitamins and supplements, and that's not really my jam or I think what this episode is about. But if you want to look at more detailed studies on the importance of whole foods during pregnancy, including vitamins and supplements. I highly recommend the book, Real Food for Pregnancy by Lily Nichols. I read it and I found it confirmed what I already knew. And a couple of clients who asked me for book recommendations who were also pregnant, I recommended it to them and they found it validating for how they now eat. But it was again, kind of just confirming what worked for them in their everyday life that they learned through our work together. But if you're someone who isn't familiar with blood sugar control or need more information to challenge the typical guidelines that are out there, totally get the book. And if you're interested in, there's a whole other piece to this of food safety, like how much caffeine can I drink? How much wine, soft cheeses, you know, listeria. I recommend the book, uh, Why the Conventional Pregnancy Wisdom is Wrong and What You Really Need to Do by Emily Oster. It's a really great book. She has her PhD in economics, but she really, again, dives into the evidence versus I want to call it like old patriarchal tales. It's not even old wives tales. It's old patriarchal tales of what we think happens in pregnancy. So her book looks at the evidence around food topics and a lot of other topics and gives you the risk benefit analysis. And why I love this book, because again, there's no black and white answers, only choices that have variable risks that you need to discern what works best for you. And this will go for the decisions you make around your pregnancy, birth, and that of your child. So Learning discernment (laughs) around your body and your health is all practice for the bodily choices you're going to be making for you and your new baby. So an example of what I found helpful at Emily's book was like, she talked about coffee and um, most people, it's safe to have up to two cups. And that's what's deemed safe for most people. But I know for me, coffee makes me anxious and crash. However, there were times I was craving it. So I would do a half decaf, half regular at home. And for those of you who are concerned about chemicals, I do Swiss press decaf, which it naturally decaffeinates coffee instead of using a chemical process. So I felt really good and safe knowing that I was having half decaf, half regular, and that I was like fulfilling this craving that I was having, which was for totally for energy, but I wasn't putting the baby at risk. You know, or she'll talk about alcohol. I think it's after the second trimester or during the second trimester, they've actually found that up to four ounces are safe. I'm not a drinker, so I don't, that doesn't apply to me. But for some people who do like it, you can now know that maybe once in a while, it's safe to have, you know, four ounces one night. So that's the kind of interesting information that you can see there. Although we'll also show you how there's, the guidelines aren't as clear cut as you think. So my client who was feeling nauseous and wanted to nourish her baby at first tried what her friends told her about bagels. And she ate a few and felt awful. And that's why she booked a session with me. She's like, what do I do? And at first she found, she's like, you know, the trouble is I, I'm finding only these pretzels were working. But what we broke down in her session to help her see was it wasn't the pretzel itself. It was the pretzel. It's that people recommend pretzels and saltines and bagels because they're easy to digest carbs, right? They don't require a lot of energy on the body. Your blood sugar does drop very low in the beginning, which is part of the nausea. Um, It has to do that. It's kind of on this software program. You'll learn more about it. Or if you've been pregnant, you probably already know about it. But we met and she decided to try getting in easy to digest carbs that were more whole foods 
and a little healthy fats to keep her satiated so she wouldn't feel more nauseous. And so she's super creative and she does like to cook, but she tried, she made waffles from like bananas and avocados, or she made pancakes with sweet potatoes and eggs. And she found that those were just as great as the pretzels and even better. And she feels so much better now. (laughs) So it's a great example that if you do have a lot of nausea, whole foods that, that are easy to digest carbs like fruit or squashes can work. Now, again, for some people, they may not, but you don't have to assume pretzels and bagels are are your only choices. I found with my little bit of nausea that happened, I only had it for about four weeks and it was only mild in the morning. I would eat some gluten-free bread in the morning because it's pretty much the same as saltines. And yet I could eat my normal healthy food at other times. And looking back, now that I understand so much more, I would have probably just had fruit and been fine. And I might've even done applesauce, um, which is already you know, kind of digested, like the the fiber starting to break down and cooked applesauce. So I might've even tried that. But the big takeaway here is the whole foods diet is still the way to go. Not whole foods, the store, because they don't even have a lot of whole foods left anymore, but real unprocessed foods. It doesn't have to be wildly different than your non-pregnant days or super complicated. You will have to adjust portion sizes and add in more carbs, proteins, or fats. And remember the rule of thumb. And of course, you have to adjust based on your nausea. That is body feedback. But remember, if you're still hungry, you probably need more protein. If if you're craving sweets, you probably need more fat or you might need a nap (laughs) because sometimes we crave sweets when we just need energy. And if you are just feeling really exhausted, you may need to add some more complex carbs. And remember that you have 40 weeks and the body is pulling from before you were even pregnant too. So you don't have to be perfect. Like this is not, like I said, I felt so guilty that first time that, that I joked our Bambino got turnpiked and my sister's like, he's going to need to learn resilience. And I was like, okay. <laughs> so it, you don't have to be perfect. So I want to talk a little bit now moving on to the psychology of nutrition at this time. One thing that can make nutrition tricky is at this time is if you spent a lifetime of restriction and dieting and haven't really worked through your relationship with food. Or what my client was experiencing, again, many of her friends didn't have a challenging past with their bodies and they were actually kind of struggling because this was the first time their bodies felt out of their control. And so they were coming from a different experience as her and they really believed in a lot of conventional ideas like, well, we're eating for two. And again, here she is in a different place with really knowing her body, valuing nutrition. And so she, how can she be in a healthy place without ignoring nutrition And again, also hanging with the great mystery, (laughs) which pregnancy is a very mysterious time. So what I want to just go under is a little bit of, of kind of conventional ideas we hear around the psychology of nutrition and give you some alternative choices or points of view. So the first trimester nausea is a big one, right? And everyone is like, you have to listen to your body. And this is so true. You might not be able to keep anything down. And that's okay, right? Like I, you just have to trust that. And if you're having, if you're, if you're hungry and you're craving some things, look for easy to digest energy, like pureed fruits or veggies and see how that works besides just having to accept that you only have saltines as a choice. And another thing in terms of the psychology of this, you know, one of the things that was interesting to my clients is she was so used to enjoying with her food and connecting it to feeling how great And especially, I mean, things again were shifting once she got these easy to digest carbs in, but she was finding now that like she would eat and just still didn't feel well. And that was just such a foreign, I mean, it wasn't foreign in the beginning, but since our work together and for a couple of years, she'd been used to feeling great from her food. And so we had to adjust what her goal was with the nausea and it was to survive. (laughs) It wasn't to have this wonderful food experience and knowing that it'll change and shift, right? And we talked about experimenting and giving her more control, which feels like more choices. And it's turned out beautifully for her. Like she's feeling so much better. She feels like she's eating well, the nausea is going down and she's getting some nutrition in for her baby and herself. But again, you have to listen to your body. And but I do want to point out that some people have, it's hypermesis gravidarum. I don't even know if I pronounced that right, but Amy Schumer had it. Kate from Will and Kate in England, right? Totally different story. It's genetic that we know, and you often do need medical support. So obviously, if you're having that condition, you got to work closely with your medical team. And you should always be checking with your medical team. Everything in this episode are guidelines and 
to get to the guideposts that work for you, you need to work with your medical provider. So this episode does not take the place of, of any type of medical intervention at all. I think that's clear, but these days you have to say it again, just to be clear. But again, that condition, there's a strong genetic component. We don't know yet why it happens. Maybe in 30, 40 years we will, but it's important to get medical support. And I think that's where Western medicine really shines in those really acute conditions. Another conventional advice we get is eat smaller meals. And I just want to say it depends. Often people have to eat smaller meals or snacks because they have poor blood sugar balance. Again, that's why they happens in real life. And that's often why it hits in pregnancy. I found with me, I could mostly stick to three meals a day, except when, when my baby was having a growth spurt and I would need an afternoon snack or like I shared earlier, I was waking up at 4 a.m. starving. So I would have to have like a little snack before bed. I, I caught on to that. Not until like the 30th week of pregnancy, which I'll explain why. But it's great if smaller meals do work for you, right? But I found with a lot of my clients who know how to balance their blood sugar, they don't like eating all the time. And when pregnant, they were fine with eating like they always have, especially after, you know, if they had first time not trimester nausea, some didn't. I have found here at the end that I split up my dinner basically into dinner and a mini meal before bed. And that has been hugely helpful in me staying asleep. But I didn't even need to experiment with, you know, these mini meals for dinner and at night way until the second trimester around I think like week 25 or 26. So obviously we're all different and you can experiment to see if you can stick with three meals a day, if that's what you prefer and was working for you in your non-pregnant life. But if you have to adjust and you need, you know, an extra snack, do that. Always trust your hunger cues is basically what this episode comes down to. The second kind of nutrition psychology that goes into pregnancy is, well, you're eating for two, right? So you've got to eat so much more food. And then we actually aren't eating for two. <laughs> In the beginning, you only need about 300 extra calories. And then as the baby gets bigger, often only need four to 500 more. When I was binging, I could easily eat an extra 3,000 calories without feeding another person. <laughs> so 300 calories is like a little extra egg and fruit with an afternoon snack. And what's interesting is a lot of people, and I've talked to some of my friends actually who have felt like this, is that they feel like pregnancy was the first time in their life they were allowed to be big. They were allowed to have a stomach. And so they felt like this was the first time that they had permission not to watch their weight or worry about their stomach. And that release gave them a sense to eat whatever. And it was kind of like this chronic restriction and tension that comes from monitoring food for years and decades was unleashed during pregnancy, right? So you may go through times where you genuinely are insatiably hungry. And it's important to check in with yourself if it's because you're truly hungry or you feel like you have emotional permission. And knowing that difference is really important. And I recommend working on your relationship to food pre-pregnancy because you will have enough to focus on while pregnant. And also realize how much extra food you actually need can be helpful. I had so many distorted ideas about pregnancy and labor and birth, and learning the science really helped guide a lot of my choices. Again, evidence-based science. So we're really not eating for two, <laughs> and it's okay if you're not insatiably hungry, but if there are times that you are, again, stick with balancing your blood sugar to keep hunger so that you're actually getting nourished and not just hungry because your blood sugar is out of whack. The, the other nutrition psychology I want to talk about is managing nutrition in the context of weight gain estimates. So weight gain estimates really go off the BMI. And if you get my uh, biweekly newsletter, Well Rounded, you know, we did a whole segment, a whole little paragraph about BMI and how it's basically bunk. It, created, it was created by a mathematician, not even a physician. Not that I would trust a physician these days anyways, but it doesn't take into context your bones, how heavy your bones are, how much fat to muscle ratio you have. And we know that's so important in terms of inflammation. And we know all these things influence your health. So anyways, you're going to come into pregnancy and they're going to give you a chart or you're in it now and you're pregnant now. And you know, they tell you how much you should, how much weight you should gain in relation to this BMI. So I'm 5'5 five five and I came into pregnancy weighing about 150 pounds. I think my beginning BMI was like 25 point something or other. I know there was a, de a decimal after that, but basically I was put in the overweight category. And because of all the work I've done with my weight, I know I'm not overweight. <laughs> I wear a size six, eight, not that you can you wear different sizes all the time, but like I'm completely comfortable with my body and it doesn't really mean anything to me, that category. But if it hadn't, I'll tell you if it really, if I had put a lot of weight <laughs> in the overweight comment, 
that could have really turned um, my gestational diabetes experience into a different direction. I'll explain quickly in a bit here. I've done so much work around my weight to know that I actually have very different metrics to know if I'm healthy or not. So I was recommended to gain 15 to 25 pounds. Now, if I had been 145 pounds, they would have recommended that I gain 25 to 35 pounds, right? (laughs) So there's like a 10, let's see, like there's as much of a spread of like 10 to 20 pounds difference based on being five pounds over. So just showing you the math is kind of interesting. And at the time of this recording, in 37 weeks, I've gained 35 pounds and it is all in my stomach. Like I've got a big stomach. (laughs) Comments lately, as I've been walking my dog around my neighborhood about how big I am and I'm not going to go to my due date. I also got this at my shower and I said to my doula, do you think I'm going to go early? And she said, nope, everyone tells everyone this stage. Everyone tells every pregnant woman this late and that you're go- you're big and you're going early, which I thought was hilarious. And, you know, I'm also starting to retain water here. In my 37th week, my rings don't fit. And if I don't put up my feet, they get swollen. So I'm probably going to gain a couple more pounds in water weight alone. And what I loved about the midwives that I'm working with is they're like, if you're exercising and eating well, they're not concerned. They're like, the body can do its thing. And that's how I feel. I've talked to a couple of health pros I know and who were very thin actually going into pregnancy and they gained 50 to 60 pounds and have had multiple pregnancies. And because they've had multiple, they know that's just what their body does. I talked with a client who went, who got pregnant. A lot of my clients are pregnant this year and had a higher BMI. And she was told not to gain any weight or to, to gain too much weight. And then she was staying the same, which can happen to, you know, based on your weight, some people actually lose weight in pregnancy. It, you know, it's everyone's so different. But then when she was staying the same, they told her that was bad. And the doctors gave her so many different opinions. And she has since had a healthy baby boy. And she's just learned to listen to her body and make healthy choices. And I'm so glad she has the trust to do that. You know, then my client who is nauseous, she is almost through the first trimester and has only gained a pound. And they say, you should gain three to four pounds in the first trimester, right? And she's like, is it enough? Now, again, obviously check in with your provider because they will do heart rate tests and all this stuff, but recognize babies don't grow in a linear fashion, right? I think it's, this is so challenging for us because when we think about weight loss, we assume we should be losing one to two pounds a week, but that's not how sustainable weight loss often works. And that means that's not how weight gain works. It's not this like linear, gradual thing. I gained more weight in my second trimester and, and my baby had a bunch of growth spurts. In fact, when I was at 24 weeks, I measured at 28 and had to go into for an ultrasound because they just wanted to make sure everything was okay. And then I leveled off. And then I think 35 and a half weeks, I was measuring at 38 weeks or no, 37 weeks. But my point is, is that like babies don't grow according to how all the other babies grow. That's not how nature works. It's not linear. Of course, you want to stay within the guidelines. And again, for me, I felt safe doing the ultrasound to confirm it was okay. But then I found it was fascinating how like basically in the next 10 weeks, I leveled out and was normal again. And then I went up again and now I'm normal again. (laughs) But to me, that's much more indicative of nature versus thinking that I'm going to have the same hunger levels, the same weight gain every week. And again, the general mental frame of the world of medicine is doesn't really match how nature really works. But we don't want to throw the baby out with the bathwater. So please hold these guidelines. And remember, they are guideposts. They can give us a place to start, but we need to bring context of our own bodies and experiences into pregnancy, whether it's nutrition or weight gain to truly know if we were, are on the right track for us. But much like our weight in our non-pregnant lives is a side effect of our food, emotional health, hormonal health, stress, and environmental toxins, Our weight gain in pregnancy isn't to be feared if we are eating healthy and staying active. And by active, I mean walking, gentle movement, or whatever works for your body. So it's such a mysterious process. And all of what I've talked about today are guidelines and really learn to tune into yourself and trust yourself. It's not a one and done process. It's continual learning, right? Science itself is a process, not a destination. If you think back to 30 years ago, we weren't even talking about the gut biome when we thought antibiotics just we're wonderful. And now we have antibiotic resistance and we know there's good bacteria, right? Not to let alone, I look at what they did in psychiatry, right? Like electric shock therapy. I mean, it's easier to just trust people. I get this, these experts, but at the, but the truth is science is a process, not a destination. And same with learning about ourselves. And I just want to 
put in a little asterisk here <laughs> about trusting ourselves. And I know that this can be so challenging. And I wanted to share my own gestational diabetes experience. I had a really, maybe some people wouldn't have been as stressed, but for me, it was really stressful. So basically, gestational diabetes is when you become insulin resistant or sensitive, and it only happens in pregnancy. And they give you a traditional test where you drink this, like basically like a 24 ounce soda. An hour later, they see how high your blood sugar is. And a lot of healthy people, and this is one big thing I learned in Lily's book, is a lot of healthy people tend to fail it because their bodies aren't used to going that through that much sugar. And also, I knew coming into this that if I, if my blood sugar goes that out of whack, first of all, I haven't drank a soda probably since I was drinking like rum and coke in college or something like that. But I didn't want to do that test, and so I for I. I chose to do home monitoring, um, which you can do, but I also (laughs) now wonder if it caused me more, more uh, problems than not. And so I did the whole, the whole home monitoring and my after meal numbers came back beautiful. They were like healthy and stellar. um, But my fasting glucose was a little bit high and that's one metric, right? There's no, these are all screening tests and there's not an agreement about what the official threshold is for fasting glucose to be considered pre-diabetic. But basically I had three doctors at the hospital here because I had to do the home monitoring through maternal fetal medicine. One doctor saw my numbers after I did got more data on my fasting glucose and he's like, oh, you're good to go, you're fine. So I stopped monitoring. And then I got a call like two weeks later and the midwife center said the doctor they were working with wanted me to continue monitoring. And then another doctor called me from the hospital and was like, you're probably fine. Um, but let's just do, you know, one week of monitoring or whatever. She goes, but I don't think you have gestational diabetes. But the doctor at the midwife center, because I was measuring at 91% in terms of baby size at 24 weeks, and I didn't take the traditional test, wanted to assume that I had gestational diabetes. And I don't know, this really upset me because I felt like I don't have this. <laughs> There's no agreed upon definition by after, you know, and when I would talk to the midwife center and this doctor, they just have this philosophical belief that they're like, it's nothing you did, Allie. It's just the body. The placenta puts off all these hormones. And because your levels are so healthy after meals and it's only at fasting, the body just can't keep up sometimes. And so they put together this whole story <laughs> using two pieces of data and, I, and part of it is cover your, they're trying to avoid malpractice, which I get, and, and we need to be safe. And there's a cost to that, right? Like it really stressed me out. They asked me to monitor for another week, which I did. I sent in my numbers. A third doctor at the hospital <laughs> told me to, that I'm fine. And they just want me to monitor to the end. And I just share this because it was me having to trust myself here and trust my body. And, and the funny thing is, you know, and not believe that my body just would poop out here at the end because the consequence of gestational diabetes is they're worried about a very large baby, which is considered over 10 pounds and then head to, to shoulder ratio with delivery, which can be very traumatic for the baby, also for the mother. So I am going for another growth scan because of this assumed diagnosis with one doctor out of four tomorrow. Cause again, I do want to be safe. But really, I mean, I had some breakdowns over this. Like I would joke in the morning, Carlos and I would be having breakfast. I'm like, okay, one more gestational diabetes obsession. You know, he's like, okay, this is not going to be the last one. But even though I've come so far with my health, right? Like these kind of health scares still are, tra- they're not tr- as traumatic as they would have been had I never done my truce with food healing work, but they still trip me up because again, having had cancer at 13, that wasn't likely to happen. And so I just have, I will never fully be able to relax. I shouldn't never say never, but I'm less likely to be able to relax, relax, especially when my whole pregnancy has been so easy and wonderful. And I just share all of this. I mean, I was on PubMed researching this. I was doing my own research because I wanted to know what my choices were and if I was really at risk or putting my baby at risk. And again, we, I probably won't officially know until he's born because the later on in pregnancies, the less accurate ultrasounds are. But I just share that because it was a really hard experience and I was really worried about it. And I ultimately had to do a bunch of research and then tune into myself. A lot of times when we talk about listening to yourself, often we're listening to the fear-based or the overly optimistic side of ourselves. So discernment involves 
I think for me, getting as much information as you can, you know, so I learned a lot about like a lot of people who are diagnosed with gestational diabetes were actually pre-diabetic and it was overlooked coming into pregnancy. That wasn't the fact for me that my doctors tried to tell me, well, you are the doctor and the midwife who I was working with said, you know, you are 40, but I don't believe that. Like, and I don't believe that my body would just quit. And what was interesting is I met with one of the dietitians who called me because she was confused as to why I was still monitoring. And I told her the situation and she said she recommended having a snack before bed, which is why I said I just caught on to this a couple of weeks ago. And she told me to add more carbs into my diet. And I had at night, I had a carb plus protein snack. And that's really brought my numbers down, <laughs> which was really interesting to me because even though I know sometimes we need carbs, but again, her advice was so reassuring and the numbers started to come down into much, you know, I mean, they, they weren't really all high to begin with, but they were consistently lower, which was great. And so it kind of confirmed my idea that the body doesn't just poop out, right? <laughs> so I was able to get more and more data as things went on that, that I'm okay in terms of this diagnosis. And while this doctor believes I have it, I don't believe I have it. <laughs> and ultimately it's under control enough with how I eat because then I was looking at medication choices that they sometimes want to give you. And there's a lot of controversy around those as well of metformin and even insulin. So it's very interesting. You think, oh, just solve that with that. But if you do the research, you realize there's controversy everywhere. And so I just want to share that because I know often on this podcast, we say you have to trust yourself. And as someone who's not used to being having regular interaction with Western medicine and how defensive, I mean, they play cautious medicine, right? It's not defensive, like they're trying out to like get you, but they just are very protective of not getting sued and also not wanting things to go wrong, which I, which I get. And it's really well-intentioned people in this system that has kind of created a certain type of education, a certain type of lens on the world. But I just want you to know that it's a process and you don't arrive at this place where you just trust yourself. You can always learn more. Again, I learned more. I learned a carb and a protein at night lowers my fasting glucose. <laughs> I also learned I can advocate for myself a lot more than I thought I would ever have to <laughs> and be okay with um, there not being a definite an answer for right now and doing what I deem is safe and precautionary to get as much data as possible so we know the answer. But I just want to share that we can listen, learn to listen to ourselves. We do that day by day, step by step. And why it was so important for me to really, I think, have done the work around my weight gain, because again, I could have built on the story that this doctor has built upon of like, well, I gained even more weight and than I should have, and my numbers are high and oh, maybe I do have it and panicked, right? But I really <laughs> so confident about that I've taken great care of myself. Um, and the weight gain is a is just it is what it is. It doesn't say anything about me. So I wanted to share that. The big takeaway here is to do as much work around your relationship to food in your body before you get pregnant. And you will learn new things in pregnancy. No matter how solid your relationship to your body is in, that's part of the plan is to open you up. <laughs> and if you're someone who's just getting into nutrition, it's a great time too. If getting into nutrition while you're pregnant, that's wonderful too. The meaning of it changes, right? It's no longer about calories and weight loss. It can be really about health and nutrition. The important thing is no matter where you are on your path is to make it your own with your own choices so you can create your own experience and really take an active role in your nutrition and health choices will make the whole experience easier. And again, it's never too late to get started with nutrition, our relationship to food or our bodies. And don't assume that what is normal or all your friends have done is the right way. <laughs> there is no one way. And I hope you remember above all, remember in these times, rebellion is quite healthy. <laughs> and take that trusting yourself and listening to your body one day at a time. I hope this episode was helpful and we'll continue on with the season next week. Thank you, Health Rebels, for tuning in today. Have a reaction, question, or want the transcript from today's episode? Find me at alishapiro.com. I'd love if you leave a review on Apple Podcast and tell your friends and family about Insatiable. It helps us grow our community and share a new way of approaching health in our bodies. Thanks for engaging in a different kind of conversation. And remember, always, your body truths are unique, profound, real, and liberating. Thank you.